Okay, welcome to unit seven. This unit is all about how to add damping to multi-degree of freedom systems. And it builds off of the concepts that we introduced in unit seven. In this video, we'll start by introducing the concept of classical damping. This is the idea that the damping matrix can be constructed in such a way that it allows the equations of motion to remain decoupled. This may seem limiting at first, but you'll see that it's actually a pretty powerful method that allows us to model almost any type of structure. In the second video, we'll discuss how to actually construct classically damped matrices. And in the third video, we'll apply everything through a practical example. So let's start with classical damping. And this is drawing from chapters 10.9 and 10.10 .10 in Chopra's book. So as always, let's start from an equation of motion. You'll notice that we have two terms that we had before, the mass matrix times the acceleration vector and the stiffness matrix times the displacement vector. But now we've also added a damping matrix times a velocity vector. Now this damping matrix C represents some set of dampers coupling the degrees of freedom of the structure. However, we won't make any assumptions about the structure of that matrix quite yet. We'll leave that for the next video. For now, we'll just assume it's a general matrix. The next step is to assume a solution. And note that in this case, the solution is exactly the same as it was before in the undamped case. We're still assuming that our response U is some set of mode shapes phi multiplied by a vector of modal coordinates. This is important because it means that our mode shapes for a damp system and an undamped system are the same. There's no such thing as damped mode shapes. The modal coordinate response or formulation will change um, into a damp response. So let's go ahead and substitute the solution into the equation of motion and see what we get. So the first substitution step is fairly straightforward. We simply plug in the corresponding values for u, u dot, and u double dot. Now let's pre-multiply by phi transpose. So after that substitution, we can simplify. We know that matrix is the modal mass matrix. We know that matrix is the modal stiffness matrix, and we can define a new matrix, which we'll call the modal damping matrix, big C. Now, since the definition of our mode shapes is not changed, we know that big M and big K are both diagonal matrices. However, since phi is not defined by C in any way, there's no guarantee that big C will be diagonal. Of course, it would be nice if it were. And so this is where the idea of classical damping comes in. Classical damping is defined as the scenario where the modal damping matrix, big C, is a diagonal matrix. And this allows the equations of motion to be decoupled, just like we had in the undamped case. So let's look at what this means in terms of equations. So we start with our equations of motion in modal coordinates. But now we are assuming that C is diagonal, so we can break it down into single degree of freedom equations, like so. And so this is a single degree of freedom form that we've seen before. So we can divide by the mass term and get our generalized equation of motion. The important thing to note here is just like every mode has a corresponding frequency, in the classical damping approach, every mode also has a corresponding damping ratio, zeta i. Based on that, we can establish the following relationship for zeta i, which we'll use over and over again in a lot of the methods. Note that now we have a link between zeta i and ci, the corresponding modal damping. 
Now at this point, it's worth mentioning some of the advantages and disadvantages of classical damping and how it compares to alternative non-classical damping approaches. Let's look first at the advantages, which we already touched upon briefly. The main one, of course, is that the equations of motion are decoupled. This means that we can solve for the multi-degree of freedom response analytically using single degree of freedom tools. The decoupled EOMs also mean that computationally this is a more efficient method. In addition, it can allow us to model as many different modal damping ratios as we want, so there's no limitation in that sense. However, it does impose limits on what the true damping matrix little c can be. In other words, that matrix has to be forced into certain forms in order to guarantee that the modal damping matrix is diagonal. That would mean that you don't have the capability to model an arbitrary configuration of physical dampers in your structure. Now let's look at non-classical damping. Of course, the first contrast is that non-classical damping is a lot harder to solve analytically. For one, you can't use single degree of freedom tools. On the other hand, with non-classical damping, you do have the ability to model arbitrary discrete damper configurations. That means if you have, let's say, a building model, you do have the ability to represent damping between stories, where these damping values could take on any arbitrary number. This leads to complex mode shapes, which are mode shapes composed of imaginary numbers. And these can actually be observed in real structures. However, they are quite rare for most practical purposes. In addition, consider that determining the values for discrete dampers for a true structure like C1 and C2 is actually quite difficult in practice. It's, it's much harder to define a discrete damping value than it is to define, say, a discrete stiffness value. And so what ends up happening is that we experimentally observe damping ratios and try to assign those. So in that sense, the framework in classical damping where we can assign these zeta values actually turns out to be not only quite easier to solve, but much more practical. So the moral of the story here is that while non-classical damping has some added features that may come in handy for very specific classes of problems, a vast majority, 80 to 90% of structural dynamics problems can be solved quite adequately using classical damping. And so that's why we will focus mainly in that area. Now, I just mentioned that the way damping is modeled typically is by making experimental observations. So let's do that so we can get a feel for what typical damping values are. So here's a plot of experimentally measured damping for real buildings versus acceleration amplitude. The figure on the left shows steel buildings. The one on the right shows concrete buildings. Now, the first observation is that damping values tend to be scattered all over the place. There are general trends, but those general trends have a lot of uncertainty associated with them. However, we do see that these values tend to be typically scattered in the range of about 1% to about 10%, with a majority lying somewhere in the middle. We also observe that steel buildings are typically less damp than concrete buildings by about 2%. Okay, and finally we see that as the acceleration amplitude increases, in other words, the building is shaking more, the observed damping value tends to go up. This has to do with the fact that damping is primarily attributed to frictional losses that happen at the joints or at support points between slab and beams. And so the more the building is shaking, the more this friction is activated and the more energy loss takes place. Note also that these values given are for the fundamental mode of these buildings. In other words, the, the first natural frequency. 
We can also look at relationships between damping and height. In this case, we observe the opposite. As the height of the building goes up, the damping tends to go down. But again, we notice a lot of scatter in the data. So again, I would use these tables to kind of ground your thinking. And so let's say, for example, a very tall steel building would have a very low damping value of around 1%, whereas maybe a short concrete building would have um, a relatively high damping value of around 6 to 7%. But keep in mind, this, in a general sense, is still quite a low level of damping. Now, given that we are going to be taking a classical damping approach, and we know what type of damping ratios we'd like our structure to have, either because we've assumed them from some of these graphs or we've measured them experimentally. There are essentially two types of methods that we can use to construct a classical damping matrix. One set of methods is called proportional methods. The other set is called non-proportional. And proportional methods basically fall into a hierarchy. At the bottom of the hierarchy, we have one of two approaches, either making the stiffness matrix mass proportional or stiffness proportional. Then one step up from that is Rayleigh really damping, which actually combines both mass proportional and stiffness proportional approaches. And one step up from that is coffee damping, which is a generalization of Rayleigh really damping. Now we'll cover methods one, two, and three. We'll leave coffee damping to the side for now. We can achieve essentially the same type of performance as coffee damping using one non-proportional approach, which is the only one we'll cover on that side, which is called superposition. And so in the next video, we'll talk about how to build the classical matrix using methods one, two, three, and five.